Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, we're so glad you could join us for Bomb's Broom with a View and the launch of Azarine Vanderfleet Olumi's striking and exquisite novel, Savage Tongues. I'm Benjamin Samuel. I'm the managing editor of Bomb Magazine. Uh, this year marks Bomb's 40th anniversary. That's four decades of delivering the voices of visual artists, performing artists, and writers like Azarine, who was interviewed by Alexandra Kleeman for Bomb's summer issue. Uh, in the introduction to the interview, Alex, uh, who is actually launching her own book tonight, um, remarked that Azarine's writing is utterly immersed in language, yet grasping something unlanguageable. And in Azarine's hands, language leaps and scuttles with renewed vigor. Savage Tongues is a prime example of Azarine's linguistic mastery, and we're all thrilled to be celebrating it tonight. Before we welcome Azarine to the room to read from her novel, uh, and engage in a conversation with our wonderful moderator, Nadia Awusu. I'm gonna give a quick overview of tonight's event and uh, then introduce Nadia. So in a few moments, Nadia will come on screen to introduce Azarine. Azarine will then give a brief reading and then she and Nadia will be in conversation followed by an audience Q and A. Uh, please use Zoom's question feature to ask your questions. It's probably somewhere at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can submit questions at any time. No need to wait for the Q&A to officially begin. Uh, additionally, you can leave comments in the chat throughout tonight's event. Uh, in fact, um, if you'd like, you could all post a message right now. Um, maybe say hello to Nadia and Azarine and let us know where you're joining us from. Um, we will also use the chat to share links where you can purchase Azarine and Nadia's books, which I highly encourage you to do. And now, finally, it is my pleasure to introduce Nadia Awusu, tonight's moderator. Nadia is a Ghanaian and Armenian American writer and urbanist. Her first memoir, Aftershocks, topped the most anticipated list of the New York Times, Oprah Magazine, Vogue, Time, and many other outlets. Nadia is the recipient of a 2019 Whiting Award, and her writing has appeared or is forthcoming in the New York Times, Granta, The Literary Review, The Paris Review, The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, Bon Appetit, and elsewhere. We're so grateful to have you here tonight, Nadia. Thank you so much, Ben. And thank you, Bomb, for having me. I am so honored and excited to be here. Um, I first encountered Azarine's work when a close friend handed me her novel, Call Me Zebra, and told me that I had to read it. Um, and this friend has never led me astray when it comes to books, so I did as I was told. And I just fell in love with Azarine's voice, with her deep sense of history um, and how it shapes us. And so I'm so excited and grateful to be here today to talk to her about her brilliant new novel, Savage Tongues. Azarine Vanderfleet Olumi is the author of the novels Savage Tongues, Call Me Zebra, and Fra Keeler, and is the director of the MFA program in creative writing at the University, University of Notre Dame. She is the winner of a 2019 Penn Faulkner Award, a John Gardner Award, a 2015 Whiting Award, a National Book Foundation 5 Under 35 honoree, and is the recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship as well as residency fellowships from McDowell and Leading House. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Paris Review, Guernica, Granta, Baum, and elsewhere. She lives in Chicago and is the founder of Literatures of Annihilation, Exile, and Resistance, a lecture series on the global Middle East that focuses on literature shaped by colonialism, military domination, and state-sanctioned violence. Azarine, congratulations on the launch of your wonderful novel. And thank you for this book, um, which as I think I said to you in an email, I felt like I needed to be in the world somehow. So I'm really happy to be here with you and I'm excited to hear you read. I'll pass it over to you now. Thank you, Nadia. Um, it's such a pleasure to, to be with you in this virtual space and, and to have you um, you know, talk about the book uh, with me. And I, I'm such a fan of Aftershocks and, you know, it's rare that we find writers we really feel excited and eager to be in deep conversation with. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to this evening. And I just wanted to say thank you too, to um, Ben and, and everybody at BOM for, for all the hard work that you put into this uh, evening. So I'm gonna read uh, briefly from um, 
from the novel, which came out today. And, and I think then we're just gonna start, start our conversation. It was early in the season. After lying empty and exposed the tides of winter, the streets were renewed by the arrival of foreign tourists. Arab sheikhs, Spaniards who kept summer apartments by the sea. The local shopkeepers had stocked and decorated their shelves, thrown their polished windows open to let in the warm air, which trembled with the prospect of money. The early summer light was brilliant, luminous, incandescent. The palms and aloes with their green arching leaves thick with water, the white stucco walls of the homes set squarely against one another, the thick papery bougainvillea that crawled across the city's surfaces like mouths painted rouge, little kisses turned toward the vivid blue of the sky. All of it screamed yes to life. We made our way through the crowd. We maneuvered our suitcases around elderly women dressed in modest pale peaches and purples and sequined flat shoes, around children playfully walking their dogs. Parents trailed languorously behind, occasionally yelling words of caution at their children who were full of zest for the lazy pleasures of summer. We walked alongside the old straw colored walls of the city, puckered with cavernous holes that resisted the bright eager light. We stopped a few times, breathless, and set down our suitcases to listen to the cawing of the crows, the whining of the seagulls. Eventually, all that remained of our journey was to cross the promenade that ran parallel to the old Arab walls, walk across the cut granite pavement, the pink and gray stone shimmering in the gleam of the sun. I felt heavy. Across the way, the light seemed to have been sucked from the sky. Darkness abided over our building. It sat on a narrow, crooked street in cold shade. As I took in its smog-stained walls, its blistering paint and cracked terraces artlessly stacked on top of one another, I felt a dreadful stirring. An acidic terror stung my throat. It was a feeling that had stirred in me then, too, during that most terrible summer of my life its darkest dawn, when the hours had passed under the Spanish sky with no one watching over me. I watched three old men come up the road dressed in brown slacks and button-down shirts, wearing espadrilles, leaning into their canes. I pictured my father alone at 14, his features swollen as they were preparing to find their final shape, his face red from the cold ocean winds, his small gray eyes raw from the searing salt of the stormy water, the damp air, his back to Great Britain, his neck and shoulders tense from the absence of his own parents, his stomach turning on the high seas. And then I thought of myself at 17, alone in the seaside apartment, my father must have thought, what a luxury, what a life this child of mine has. Ellie reappeared in the corridor. I'm sorry, she said. I'm sorry too, I told her. It was my fault. I shouldn't have been so abrasive. You don't need to apologize, she conceded. It's just, it's hard to guess what you're feeling sometimes. I gave Ellie a knowing look, then walked past her into the bathroom. I needed to wash my face. The bathroom, narrow, rectangular, windowless, smelled damp with mold. The mirror had lost its shine. I looked at myself. I looked eaten with exhaustion. I remembered seeing my face staring back at me helplessly from that mirror before. My mouth stretched into a painful grimace. I'd been hungry. I thought of all the figs Omar and I had eaten that summer, of all the times we'd pulled to the side of the mountain roads on his Ducati and removed our hel helmets to pluck fruit from the trees. We'd fed them to each other. We'd been happy, happy at the expense of my future self. I wondered if that younger version of myself had known the power she'd ultimately wield, 
if she'd known then that I'd be accountable to her for the rest of my life, pushing myself to find to my limits, trying to retrieve her from the abysmal well she'd found herself in. I wanted to tell Ali that after the first terrible time when Omar had forced himself on me, trapped me the way he trapped that wild boar and had his way, I'd gone back for more until it became the most natural thing in the world. I wanted to tell her that my memories of the time I'd spent with Omar outside of the bedroom felt nebulous and disjointed, that I needed to remember more than the sour smell of his sperm, the way it spilled onto his belly when he came, soaking his pubes, making his skin glow in the dim light of all the rooms we'd ever exchanged fluids in. But I couldn't find my voice, and besides, Ali was already intimately familiar with my story, and in any case, she had stories of her own. Ali had witnessed firsthand the power sex has to destroy, to decimate, to stifle. She'd left home at 15, unable to withstand the severity of her parents, the surveillance culture of the wider Orthodox community, the oppression bearing down on her body, the covenants policing her sex, curbing her desires. She'd lived on the streets for a year, sleeping under bridges huddled together with other runaways, relying on strangers' leftovers, which she stole off the tables at sidewalk cafes. She moved in with a man halfway through the year, an older man in his 20s who was far more sexually experienced than she was. He'd insisted that in exchange for a warm bed and shelter, she had to sleep with all of his friends, and she'd done it. She had removed herself from her body. She had floated above herself or stood beside herself and watched this other curly-haired girl twist her body to conform to the needs of others. She told me that a few times this girl, this other girl, had lifted her face as if she were searching for Ellie but that her gaze had been vacant, that she'd stared emptily at something behind Ellie, that after that, Ellie had removed herself altogether from the room. I'd been remorseless toward myself, unforgiving, she'd said to me once. She'd spent years in therapy, sewing together all of her dissonant parts. She'd become convinced that the Israelis' unacknowledged violence against the Palestinians the repressed fear and guilt and grief of protecting one's life at the expense of another's was erroneously expressed through sexual aggression. Sex, she believed, had become a way for the lost youth of that dense, troubled land to work through the cycle of violence and inherited fear that had shaped their lives. As well, Ellie walked into the bathroom and stood behind me, her plastic peach-colored makeup bag in her hand, I remembered that we'd walked past the cafes that she'd stolen cold french fries and half-eaten falafel from, and that we'd realized then that anything that has the ability to create life has the capacity to exterminate it in equal or greater measure. We had talked about the fact that sex could simultaneously create life and extinguish it, that people were either in denial of its power or terrified of it that the closest Western society had come to acknowledging its influence was its romanticization of motherhood, excuse me, and procreation, a facet of femininity neither one of us was particularly interested in. I took in Ellie's face in the mirror. I tried to speak, but the words wouldn't rise up through my chest. There was something in my throat holding them down. I could feel the accumulated pressure of all the tears I hadn't shed. Some understanding was taking shape, but the constriction in my throat was likely a result of my silence, a silence that had become habitual, that had shut me down, cut me off from myself. I had tried my whole life to recover my relationship to language. I had tried through writing to arrive at the totalizing quality of torture, its capacity to destroy speech, to exterminate the contents of one's consciousness, to turn reality itself, all of the concrete objects of one's life 
walls, underwear, couches, into participants in one's destruction. But I wasn't sure that I'd found adequate language for my pain. I wasn't even sure that a structure built of words was capable of containing it. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Azarine. I'm trying to come back. Okay, I think I'm unmuted now and I think I'm on video. Um, sorry. Um, that was a lovely reading. Thank you so much um, for sharing that with us. Um, there's so much that I want to discuss with you um, and so much that I admired about this novel. And I was reading it um, just as I was beginning to kind of take baby steps out into the world again after being physically isolated for so long. And I was really struck by how you write about um, relationships, friendships, families, um, the ways in which we affirm one another, and particularly um, in terms of uh, Ellie and Arezu's relationship that you kind of um, touched on in the reading, but how we heal in community um, and the potential for saving one another and belonging to one another. Another. And I thought that it was really significant that the families and communities that you were writing about were really expansive. They were sort of chosen um, and not defined along traditional lines or restricted by kind of the boundaries and borders that we are typically given to define who we belong to. Um, and you write about friendship as a form of witness how others hold um, our stories with love. And so despite the isolation, um, more than ever, you know, those relationships, for me, that expansive sense of belonging, um, and as someone like you who has roots in so many places, um, that was sort of what sustained me through, you know, the, the months of isolation. And so I wanted to talk to you about that. And I wanted to talk to you about how you were thinking about belonging and what it means to belong. Um, as you wrote this novel, and also maybe how the writing shaped your experience of the last year. <laughs> I mean, I think this last year has made it really evident how important physical contact is, you know, just, I can go alone for a long time and still feel very sane, just because of, you know, our writing practice kind of trains us to, to have that discipline of, of just being um, alone and on a page, you know, just day after day, but you always know that you're going to be able to leave the page and embrace your loved ones or be, be near your family or your friends. And, and just having that possibility taken away from us, I think, um, you know, it's striking and, and I think opens up a great, uh, window through which people might be able to experience greater compassion for those of us who, um, you know, are permanently severed from our homeland or our families, um, or, you know, looking at the immense refugee crisis that's happening right now, particularly in the Middle East. Um, and I think the book is dealing a lot with what it means to be an implicated subject in violence, what it means to, to sort of be a participant, no matter how remote we think our lives are from from the maybe hot spot of a particular geopolitical crisis, um, but that really our lives are completely unfolding within this fabric of political trauma constantly. And to some of us, that's always in the foreground more so than others, but I mean, COVID, I think raised our collective consciousness to a more critical level um, when it comes to to what it really means not to be able to access those points of reference that have stabilized your character or your sense of identity or your sense of belonging. Um, this is a book that's really a, a love letter to friendship. And, you know, it's a book where there's a violent relationship between the narrator and Omar um, in the background. Really, for me, it's not, it's the propeller of the novel, but the novel's real love story is between these friends who find one another from their positions of dispossession or displacement and are able to hold each other's stories in, in such radical transformative ways. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that that certainly was what kind of really deeply moved me about the experience of reading this book, just the profound ways in which um, together they were able to kind of wrestle with all of these histories of violence that they carried, um, but that they needed each they needed one another, you know, to, to kind of carry and hold and hold each other through that journey and um, kind of connected to that. Um, and you were kind of touching on that in your answer in terms of how people are stabilized and destabilized in terms of their relationship to place, to history, to violence. And I wanted to hear you um, speak a little about how this book engages particularly with hybridity and multiplicity of identity, mm -hmm. um, multiplicity of selves. Um, the, the protagonist of, of Savage Tongues declares early in the book, I am a half-formed thing, neither this nor that. My mother is Iranian, my father British. Um, and in addition to reckoning with trauma that results from sexual violence, um, she's also reckoning with what it means to be made up of all of these identities that in the world and in her body are in conflict with one another. Um, and um, and so I wanted to, to hear you talk about that, some of the questions that you are exploring in the novel related to, to those themes and, and maybe what some of your discoveries were as you wrote into those questions. Yeah, um, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a big, big question and a really important one. I, I think that, you know, the, the geopolitical crisis that these characters come out of, whether it's the crisis um, in Iran or, or the violence that is systemic in the United States. And then there's the Palestinian and the Israeli, um, you know, issue of ethnic cleansing and occupation and settler colonialism. All of these things are sort of in informing the very fabric of their identities as, 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 um, you know, as people and the sexual violence happens sort of in their adolescence. And when I was thinking about what it meant for the narrator to return 20 years later to the home in Spain where the violence happened with Omar and to really kind of do this sort of um, embodied uh, sort of ex exploration and excavation of that space that held so much trauma for her, it became really clear to me very quickly that the narrative of victim and aggressor that only looks at the peace between two individuals in the privacy of, a, of an intimate space, that is an insufficient way for us to be talking about sexual violence, particularly because we see so, so much, it's so rampant the way that women's bodies get um, you know, plundered in times of war, in times of geopolitical crisis, the way that history is deposited into female bodies. And then also how colonialism sort of um, produces and generates uh, modes of desire and yearning, right? And um, the way that interracial marriages have been um, policed and censored throughout history. All of these dynamics exist in their lives in the Middle East and the, the narrator and myself, as I was writing, I was like, there is no way to really look at this question of how it is that she came not only to be subjected to Omar's violence, but also to crave it. It's not possible to separate that from the violences that the political violence that existed for her in Iran as a person who of hybrid identity, right, who is feels conflicted between the parts of her that identify with the colonizer and the parts of her that identify with the colonized and the ways that these two parts reject one another. And then in the American landscape to complicate it even more, the way that gets mapped onto our landscape here is the pressure to um, choose a side, to, per to, to perform a kind of authenticity of identity, of ethnicity and race. Um, and hybrid bodies, plural bodies, really kind of put a lot of pressure on the discourses of colonialism and nationalism in a way that's very, I think, urgent and necessary. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a book about pluralism and all of the contradictions that we have to hold when we belong to places that completely are hell-bent on really annihilating one another, um, sadly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the way that 
you sort of illuminate that is very much in um, in moving back and forth between these intimate spaces and these larger forces that are shaping um, the violences that take place in rooms between individual, you know, in interpersonal relationships, and. Um, and, but you're also very much um, interrogating the ways that sort of history is present in those spaces, whether or not we're paying attention to it. But our, our narrator and her friend are very much paying attention to it. They're very much aware um, of, of those violences and of history and the language that we use. And those are things that they're interrogating together. That is part of sort of how they're working to save themselves and one another in so many ways. And it's perhaps because of that awareness and the intentional and kind of rigorous way that they work to understand it that makes it possible for them to kind of open up into new possibilities for what the world could look like. And so I wanted to hear you talk about that a little bit, um, about, you know, you touched on um, already kind of the ways that people enact brutal and violent histories in their intimate relationships and what that looks like. Um, but I would also love to hear you um, talk about what it might look like to reinterpret, reclaim and interrogate those histories and um, toward, you know, potentially um, even liberation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, um, you know, a writer that was really important to me and has always been important to me, but particularly for this book was Audre Lord and the way that she talks about kind of this intense self interrogation of self uh, and the, the way that history lives in our bodies is an act of political warfare. And, and I think that the friendship between these, um, you know, cis women and, um, you know, trans men and queer women in this book and the radical nature of their sort of intellect and the way that they are archiving histories that the master narrative wants to make disappear and laying claim to them um, and you know reinforcing one another's resilience that's all an act of political warfare in a sense it's you know um, and not necessarily in a way that uh, just ret returns aggression it's really looking, going underneath the political narratives, like being aware of the political ideology that's informing their lives, but then going underneath it into the nature of trauma and the nature of um, survival and the way that a, the, the, the way that they, for example, understand um, Israel is through a kind of uh, trauma-based uh, policy, right, of uh, having had one survival injured in such a catastrophic way and, um, you know, when it comes to the, the, the Holocaust and then having to um, figure out what it means to protect oneself after that and beyond that, um, having lived through and inherited memories of, of genocide and then to then have to contend with a kind of complete occupation cleansing, destruction, and death of the Palestinian peoples, and the ways that trauma kind of puts a wall up and makes it very difficult to see both sides, to hold both sides. And I think that the, the power and the friendship is, is getting into the emotional, you know, the emotional content that that political ideology, you know, further distorts and further damages, right? The, making it impossible for them to see one another. So the friendship is a Muslim woman, culturally Muslim woman with, with a Jewish woman who traveled back to Andalusia in Southern Spain, which is a historically Sephardic and Islamic space from which both groups of peoples were completely um, exterminated and you know, were forced out. So that shared history is a lost history, right? Like what would it look like for us to recover that shared history, that shared pain and the way that, um, you know, continental European political modernity has actually, and colonialism has actually created this massive crisis and conflict, right? Um, and so it's, the book is all about triangulating these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, and Kind of opening up um, that question a little bit in terms of how violence and trauma kind of impact how we experience 
the world, place, time. I was also really interested specifically in um, kind of how um, how you write about how trauma distorts and fractures and divides our sense of self. Um, and the, the kind of violence that's in the, the, the center of the book, the kind of intimate violence um, that um, Arezu experiences um, with Omar, um, you still are kind of interrogating questions about autonomy and power even through that and what it looks like to, um, to yeah, complicate um, narratives about autonomy and power and violence. And so um, I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit, um, like what that interrogation looked like, why um, our protagonist must do it, what it costs, and why it was so important to insist upon the complexity, particularly in terms of that relationship with Omar. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it, it's, I think, really important for, for her to kind of look at the question of consent from all of the complications that that term implies and to look at the ways in which um, narratives of sexual violence and the expression of having experienced sexual violence is also censored to a large degree. And I, I need to sort of back up for a second. I mean, she is a narrator who is really swinging back and forth between these fond memories of sexual initiation that she had with Omar, but also in the context of having lost, you know, her family and the violence that happens with her brother in the American landscape and, and the ways that that's informing her survivor's guilt or her desire to maybe self-destruct, all of those things are informing, right, her kind of um, attraction to Omar and she's very naive to how much power he would have over her. He's much older. Um, and his background has to do with having been raised in the midst of the Lebanese civil war. Um, but he's also very emotionally mature, you know? So emotionally he's sort of 17 and she's 17. And so there's there's a way in which they understand and crave one another, but the the, it's a complicated question because she both remembers that um, very viscerally, like she, in the book, there's lots of scenes where she's having just a physical memory of desire toward him at the same time that she's able rationally to see that their relationship um, was, was not entirely consensual and that there was an extreme kind of power dynamic there that's informed by um, just gender privilege, but also all of the other things that we've been talking about in terms of the gender dynamics of, of the region and the silences that she was taught to, to kind of embody and perform. Um, but you know, the narrative of saying that she was a survivor or a victim is an incomplete narrative for her story. And um, it's, it just doesn't, it wouldn't do her justice. And so she needed all of this space to kind of go back and forth and, and think through it. And what is even, what are the distances between the realities of, of sexual life on the ground? And then um, the way that the law determines kind of ethical sexual encounters because the age of consent in the three countries that she's raised in are completely variable. I mean, in Spain, it's 14. In Iran, a woman is an adult at, at at nine and then a different kind of adult at 13. Um, and then the United States, it's 18. And, and how these are all moral codes that are, are sort of dictated by, um, you know, discourses of nationalism and how we identify as a nation and what we perceive to be correct and ethical, and then how we enforce those things. And um, you know, she has to just live with the memory of the trauma in her body and in her psyche. So it doesn't really, the experience doesn't really square with, mm -hmm. with all of those, you know, uh, ways that we police these discourses of, of female sexuality, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and she, she decides to kind of return um, to the sites of some of the most traumatic events of her life, and particularly to this apartment um, where much of her relationship with Omar takes place to kind of um, really 
um, look very closely and examine these memories and to try to kind of make sense of them for herself. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that decision to sort of return um, to that place and specifically to talk to you about the place itself, um, both in terms of um, what we were talking about in terms of the histories being connected and sort of your choice um, to set it in this part of Spain where, you know, much of the history of has been erased um, by the master narrative of this place that um, that she wants to connect to, but then also to this apartment specifically. And the apartment kind of becomes a site of a so sort of haunting, um, a place to kind of intentionally battle the ghosts of her of her history. And so I wanted to talk to you a bit about about place about setting about your choice to kind of um both uh, your choice both in terms of um setting it in this part of spain but then also um kind of uh, setting it in this apartment and then also the idea of return and you know um her choice to kind of return to these places yeah i'm really interested in in what it means to return <laughs> Um, you know, Call Me Zebra also is is a return journey and in the ways in which it's impossible to return because we've changed and place changes constantly. Um, but I'm really, I don't know, it's something that I always go back to because the possibility for, for me, I, I suppose, to return to Iran is really fraught and challenging. And since that choice is taken away from me and is completely foreclosed, mm -hmm. then it really puts pressure on what does it mean to return and what does it mean to be able to return and what does it mean when you can no longer return but that place continues to live inside your body and the language is still in your consciousness and um, you're still dreaming of that place, right? Daydreaming or dreaming about it at night and, and yet you can't reach it. Like it no longer exists as a material reality for you. So, you know, where, where I can return, you know, is Spain and so, and the United States and, and different parts of the Middle East, but I am really interested in what it means to kind of catalog that because it's a site of both displacement and yearning for me as a, as a writer and then for, for, for the narrator, it, it was really interesting, just as an experiment to kind of put her back in, in that apartment and see how, um, you know, the, the ways that memory, you know, memory is so amoeba-like, it's so mercurial, it's always changing. And then when you look at trauma, which lives in memory, and the fact that our memories are constantly changing means that our relationship to the trauma and our understanding of the trauma is also always evolving. And then you bring in this layer of language and how language can both be weaponized to kind of destroy us, um, but also can bear witness to that transformation of trauma and memory across time and space. And so I wanted to plant her into a very concrete physical space so that she could really kind of experience the way that language can be recovered as a tool to catalog the very details of that material space and the way that Omar's fingerprints are all over the walls and the space itself has agency and begins to move in very surreal ways um, and kind of, you know, see where will language take her if she's constrained in this space that's layered, right? Her, her present self is recovering a past self in this space. She's also thinking out to Palestine, to Andalusia back in the day, right, to other parts of Spain, to America. Um, so yeah, it was, an, it was a really interesting way to kind of put pressure on her as a character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, that, that, is, um, that is a really kind of palpable feeling um, uh, of reading the book in terms of kind of seeing her return to this place. And, um, and I think that it is also connected to, um, to the way that she's experiencing time, and which we all experience time in this way. You know, you were talking about trauma existing in memory, and I think that that is so true and made brought to life um, in such powerful ways in this book. Um, but necessarily, the plot of this book cannot be moving in one direction. It can't just be moving forward into the future. You know, past, present, and future coexist. And I really loved the ways in which you kind of 
um, made that so clear by setting it in this apartment because it is a an, it is a place where the past is alive, um, and and so um, we're both experiencing um, her uh, kind of grappling with the trauma in the present. We're experiencing her and her friends sort of imagining what the future might look like um, as they kind of work to heal, and we're also very much in the past as she's experiencing it. Um, and sort of um, trying to make meaning of what happened to her. And I think that this is probably more realistic in terms of how most of us actually experience time. Mm -hmm. um, but there is often, you know, the pressure um, or expectation in literature of kind of linearity or simple causality. Um, and, and in the novel, um, uh, our narrator finds the word plot itself problematic and artificial um, because um, she feels that it tries to make reality more manageable. Um, and she craves literature that is sort of untethered and boundary crossing, which is the kind of literature that this book is. Um, so I wondered if you could talk about how you thought about time um, and how you thought about time specifically related to, to the plot, the many plots um, in, this, mm -hmm. in this novel. Yeah, I mean, time is one of those things that we experience, you know, in so many ways that are specifically cultural, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, I've never had a linear experience of time. I've learned how to have one because I am also American and I live here and efficiency um, and linearity are, are, are highly valued. And that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just a, a fact. Um, even in the way that grammar works, English language is so delightfully simple. I mean, it's perfect for a writer because it's sort of subject, verb, object, and you can take it apart and expand it in so many ways. It makes it very capacious, right? <laughs> um, so I can think and feel in um, spatialities and temporalities that aren't American, that are perhaps more Islamic in their sensibility, which is more circular, it's more spiral-like, it's, um, you know, the past and the present are always um, laid on top of one another. There is a symbolic relationship to the past as well that gets reenacted and spoken of. Um, and then there is just the fact of being immersed in physical spaces like Spain, where history is, is very deep and is very present in the plastic world, right? Like in the architecture and the streets. Um, and, and so I, I was, you know, I am really interested in mapping uh, the life of the mind onto the page and writing literature that is so close to the way that we experience time. And of course that's not um, as, you know, we don't have as great an appetite for that as we do for literature that moves more quickly, um, where we have a sense that something is being accomplished, which, you know, is very much um, part of the mythology of, of the American narrative of what makes a good story in America is sort of, you know, make something happen, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, mm -hmm. it's linearity and efficiency do definitely inform the way that we think of a good story and good literature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, you know, I think um, having grown up uh, largely in Africa and in African cultures, we also don't experience time in a linear um, uh, way. And so the, the, the fact of past, present and future coexisting felt so true to me. Um, and um, and it was very exciting to me to kind of encounter it in the way that it that you wrote it. It's so connected to um, to kind of an embodied sense of of a person in place and time. Um, so that was something that that really um, that I connected to really strongly. Um, maybe I'll ask one more question and then we'll see if if there are more questions from um, from the audience. Um, I want you touched on this a little bit um, in in your last answer, but I wanted to hear you speak a little bit more about kind of the role of literature and language in the process of self knowledge and self actualization, um, which is which is definitely a theme in in Savage Tongues and was also as return was also a theme in Call Me Zebra, um, the kind of a uh, role of language and literature was also a theme there. So I wanted to hear you talk a little bit about how you're thinking about 
um, language and literature connected to self-knowledge, self-actualization, and self-creation in some ways, um, world creation even, um, in your work. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's the main tool for, um, for sort of acquiring knowledge and, and understanding the, the self and understanding the ways that narratives have been deposited in our psyches and that those narratives can sometimes, um, un left unexamined, do a lot of, a lot of damage. And it's, um, you know, the ways that our reality of who we are and, and what, what our roles are in the world are really informed by all of the things that we avoid or we're told we should avoid. And leaning into trauma really deeply and literally physically leaping into it in order to learn how to swim in it is not something that we're encouraged to do. There's a lot of fear of, well, what will happen if you're in grief free fall for a long time or where if you lose control, where will it stop? Mm -hmm. And I feel very at home in language. And I also feel that language has that untethered quality. I mean, it's, this also is very cultural. Like for me, language is really alive and it has its own consciousness and it's very organic. And when I'm writing, of course I exert pressure on language, but it also does its own thing. And I have to learn to be in conversation with it and let it lead to places I may not have expected. And often it's wiser and smarter than I am. And, and it shares that quality with trauma, with grief, um, just like it does with joy, right? These are things that are so expansive. Like, um, and since I know how to be in language in this way, that's very, let it just, you know, like walking through the dark in language and letting it lead the way, I'm comfortable being immersed in grief or in deep joy. Um, and, and then bringing them together in a book where language is literally the tool that she's using to excavate something that is beyond speech or that she has been made to feel is beyond speech um, felt really powerful um, to, to just, I think that the novel is itself an act of bearing witness to what happened and that wouldn't be possible without language, which is the medium that she's using to do that. And all of the characters in the novel are writers, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was such a beautiful answer. Thank you. Um, so let's see, we have some questions um, from the audience. Uh, Grace says, thank you for this beautiful reading and a really engaging conversation. I was wondering if there are any artworks of another medium, visual art, music, um, that are reflected in or that you were thinking of as you wrote your book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, gosh, there's probably a lot of pieces of, of art or film um, that you know, have informed the novel. I was just talking to a friend about the trilogy, Red, White, Blue, um, which is this like this, this series of films that are um, really immersive and bizarre. And there's always this kind of darkness and electric charge running through them, but I haven't seen them in many, many years. But if I had to think about a film that would speak to the atmosphere of the novel, that's what would come up. But Really, I think a piece of architecture was really important to me. And it was the Alhambra in Andalusia, the palace that they, the two friends actually never make it inside of. Mm -hmm. And the Alhambra is full of passageways and arcades um, and doorways that are carved like to look like keyholes, but there's multiple doorways carved like that in receding order. And then, you know, you're sort of walking through them into a courtyard and then into another courtyard. And, it has this very accordion like um, the way that the space keeps unfolding. Um, so I think, yeah, that really did inform the, the way that I was thinking of the architecture of the novel. Hmm. Interesting. Um, another question um, Is friendship deeply compromised by racial identity? Um, I think it can be, yeah, for sure, of course. I think it can be deeply compromised. And I think that it can 
um, not racial identity, but the ways that we have been taught to either love or loathe one another. That's what compromises it. It's not the racial identity in of itself. Um, and I think that friendship is also trans, these transgressive friendships that have been forbidden, just like intimate marriages or love lives or being queer, all of these things have been forbidden, you know? And um, we don't really think about friendship in that continuum, but it's true. You might not have the opportunity to make a friendship when we live in deeply segregated societies or there's, you know, a separation wall. And I think that genuine friendships that cross those boundaries require a tremendous amount of courage and excellent boundaries to sort of know when to listen and you have to grow into them and you can't be in them without examining yourself, um, whether it's your sense of dispossession or your privilege or whatever intersection of those two things. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, I was so struck in the in, in your novel with the depth of conversation about their identities and positionality and relationship to place and power and privilege that these friends um, have with one another. And I think, you know, that's the way that friendship is not deeply compromised by racial identity when you're willing to kind of take out all of those things and examine them together. Um, mm -hmm. So I thought that was one of the, the really beautiful things about, about the book. Um, okay, another question from Naomi. Both Call Me Zebra and Savage Tongues are very intellectual, but also full of incredibly sensual descriptions of the physical world, the taste, smell, sights of place. Is that an intentional balance for you as you work? Um, and how do the two complement one another? Yeah, I think it's definitely um, an important balance for me in the sense that, you know, I'm, my work can be really cerebral, um, but I'm, you know, I also think like that has to be balanced with deep embodiment and just being in, in the beauty of the physical world and eating. Eat, there's a lot of descriptions of food in the novel. Um, and uh, I love landscapes so much. Like I'm just the natural landscape and also the ways that we've built these landscapes to contain our lives and to shape them ourselves like throughout history. I'm fascinated by architecture and I, those, you know, cities are stories too, you know, and they're, they're always evolving. And, and I'm really interested in just kind of the way that a landscape painter would set up their, their easel and canvas and just try to paint a space. Like that's exactly how I think of writing a novel. I just think, okay, well, this is my page and I have to do justice to the space and how am I gonna capture it and capture its rhythms. And I think that helps to, to counterbalance the, the more cerebral um, parts of the books. Mm -hmm, definitely. Um, kind of shifting gears in this next question. Um, I just wanted to ask you about liter uh, I think this is for both of us, about literary criticism and where you go to find opinions about contemporary literature. Um, Lauren Euler and Brandon Taylor have both written about their dissatisfaction with the corporate prearranged, marketed, and publicized nature of modern discourse, leading to reviews that are predictable at best and dishonest, manipulative, compromised at worst. Mm -hmm. Are there any other voices you turn to who actually manage to keep it real and honest? You want to take it, Nadia? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I do think that there is um, some wonderful literary criticism out there um, and people really thoughtfully kind of writing about books. I, I tend to stay out of the um, quote unquote discourse um, that often takes place online um, uh, on Twitter and such. Um, but I think, I, I don't know, the way, I guess this, maybe this is because, um, you know, I was for a very long time very interested in books, but wasn't necessarily in the literary world. And so I wasn't as deeply engaged in sort of formal literary criticism. Um, but I had wonderful conversations about literature and books with the people in my life um, who are also deeply passionate and interested. And I think when you're in dialogue, um, it's, it's a different sort of um, relationship to the work. 
Um, and that's why I love book clubs. I love kind of group chats where we kind of are reading the same book. But for me, yeah, it is a more, more kind of personal, yeah, like even the way that I, I learned about you, Azarine, was a friend, you know, telling me, I think that this will really resonate with you. I really want you to read this book, and then I want to talk to you about it. Um, it would call me Zebra. That's how I discovered it. And, and I think that that's still kind of where, where I get a lot of my um, ideas about what to read and also kind of change my mind sometimes, which I think is one of the things that, you know, is probably lacking from kind of the Twitter discourse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think word of mouth is still so powerful, you know, even though there are all these social and capital forces, like, yeah, it's still the good old word of mouth, like read this book from someone you trust. Um, and I think there is some good long form criticism happening, though, like, uh, I really, really value um, the New York Review of Books, I think they do a phenomenal job. Um, and yeah, like the LA Review of Books has had some really good essays on books that I've read over the last few years. So it's, it's out there, but it does seem to be um, kind of scarce. And, and yeah, it's word of mouth. It's sometimes it's just seeing a book over and over again, like you think, oh, this keeps coming up. So maybe I should look into it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's a good question. Yeah. I definitely do. And bomb. Yes, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I definitely. I definitely agree. I think actually bomb because it's um, interdisciplinary is just thinking in really interesting ways about art and um, writing and language and, and the visual world for sure. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I think that's why, you know, the, the kind of longer form um, essays that are out there that I often will turn to because they're making connections between different works. You know, mm -hmm. it's not just like a review, but it's engaged with kind of context and um, the tradition in which this work might be connected to. And, and with the longer form, you're able to kind of um, speak to all of those things as well. Um, Okay, another question. I'm so happy to hear you read your work. Um, thank you for your detailed answers. You use such exquisite descriptive adjectives when you write. I can see, feel, hear what you describe. What inspired your writing in this way? Oof. Um, I mean, I, for me, what a good novel does is transport readers and that's actually one of the great pleasures of reading is to, I think, both transport the reader and then bring them home to themselves in an unexpected way or to look at themselves. But in order to do that, I do feel that as a writer myself, like the generosity of a reader's time also means that I have to put in the time to really, and the discipline around the craft to create to persuade and to seduce, you know, it's still like a great act of seduction in many ways. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, let me see if there are any more questions. Um, well, I don't see any other questions. If anyone has a last question, please do feel free to put it in the Q&A. Um, but maybe in the meantime, I'll ask one more question. Um, so uh, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but I was really kind of inspired by how your characters are working to create future in the choices they're making in the present, um, just in terms of how they live their lives, how they're in relationship with one another. And I was particularly struck by a passage in which you write about a heaven that is not constructed from our limited position on earth or from our religious perspectives, but that is really abundant and wide open and that allows opposing realities to exist without judgment. Um, and so I was hoping to hear you talk more about this, about shifts in consciousness and behavior toward creating, you know, future states, maybe even heavenly future states. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that the the conversation between Ali and, and Arazu is one that's really starts as a cerebral conversation, but really moves into a metaphysical or spiritual one. 
Um, and it comes back to what I was saying about language and how I believe that language has its own consciousness and how it sort of has its own alchemy and it can transform their consciousness. And they do pull apart and aside all of these different parts of their identity and the way that they intersect. Um, and that deep meditation within language of who they thought they were, who they were told they were, and then who they feel they might be underneath of that if they can liberate themselves from it, um, allows them to reach for this futurity where pluralism and contradiction and multiplicity aren't things or entities or parts of oneself that are competing with one another. I mean, it's to me that was the, the liberatory sort of journey of the novel was to say, actually, all of these parts of our identities are hemmed in and censored and controlled. And it is almost a requirement to be singular, you know, and anybody who isn't, who's non-binary in every definition of what non-binary can mean, right? Ethnic, racial, sexual, um, gender-wise, like is having to struggle against the requirement of singularity. And it becomes, we become more unruly, you know, when we're plural and, and so be it, you know, there's no stopping it. And, and I think that it's so necessary and it's kind of like taking the shackles off of our minds in a way. Mm. That was so beautiful and powerful um, and probably a good note to kind of close out our conversation, but this has been such a joy um, to talk to you about this wonderful book. Um, thank you um, for writing yeah, yeah. and thank you for this lovely conversation. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you both, Ezreen and Nadia, uh, for sharing, sharing such an illuminating and, and profound conversation with us. Um, I really admire how you're able to address such complex ideas like the, the consciousness of language or friendship as an act of transgression with um, so much uh, compassion and eloquence. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you to everyone watching and, and who joined us tonight for the launch of Azarine's new novel, Savage Tongues. Um, if you haven't already, please pick up a copy of, and pick up a copy of Nadia Wosu's Aftershocks. Uh, we've got links in the chat. Um, you can also pick it up from your local indie bookstore or your library. Uh, and speaking of libraries, um, if you'll be in the New York City area on August 14th, um, I hope you'll join us and your favorite indie presses for the small press flea at the Brooklyn Public Library's main branch. Um, there's a ton of indie publishers who are excited to hang out with their readers. Um, and plus the event is sponsored by Vacation Sunscreen and Topo Chico. <laughs> 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 uh, so <laughs> yeah, very strange sponsors, but we're very grateful to them and it's gonna be a really fun event. Um, so yeah. Uh, all that information about SPF is at bombmagazine.com. Uh, you can download our podcast views there. You can subscribe to our quarterly magazine and you can read Azarine's interview with Alec Alex Kleeman. Uh, we hope to see you all again soon. And until then, please keep each other safe and wear a mask. <laughs> Good night, everyone. Good night.